Okay. Here we go. It is a pleasure to introduce the next speaker. In fact, it isn't one speaker, there are five speaker. Um, I have to look on the name text. It's Anne again. It's Celes, <laughs> Camilla, Lydia, and Alexandra talking about the, the um, major events in KDE Woman in the last year. So give them a warm welcome. So really the purpose of this talk isn't necessarily to talk about gender issues in KDE. Um, I'm sure we've heard a lot of that over the year from other projects. Really the purpose of this talk is to demonstrate a lot of the different work that KDE women actually do in the project. And so we have five of us here. Uh, we're definitely not representative of all the women in KDE. There are a ton of women at this conference. I, probably the hugest number of women I've ever seen in an open source conference of this size, so that's great. Um, but, you know, we couldn't get everybody here, we couldn't get everybody organized, and plus hearing from five people in 45 minutes, that's a lot of content to take in. So hopefully uh, we will entertain and inform you of all the different things that women do for KDE. And um, I guess we can just say a little bit about ourselves before we talk about our topic instead of first. So we'll each spend about five minutes talking about one of the things that we do for Katie, and then at the end, um, hopefully we'll have some time for questions. We had some technical problems. So first up is Anne. Thank you. Thank you. Just uh, for a quick moment, how I got into KDE at all. Well, I started off using Mandrake back in 8.0, I think it was, and I was struggling. But I found the mailing list, the newbie mailing list. And I was surprised how quickly I found that I could answer some of those questions. Things that people were asking were things I'd already solved. So I began to get regularly involved in that, and it just grew. But my life was depending more and more on KDE PIM. And my computer had a hardware problem just before Christmas once. No diary, no address book, no contacts list, no gifts list. Utter tragedy. Absolute, complete tragedy. And by this time, I was getting more and more involved. Over five years, in fact, it gradually grew. But it was gradual. And then after about five years of this, I was invited to join the EV. And very soon after that, I went to my first academy in Glasgow, 2007, in utter fear and trepidation. And on that first evening when I was registering, two important things happened. First of all, I met two men in the lift on the way up to registration. That was Till Adam and Mirko Baum. And from there, I learned utter frustration of developers with users' mailing lists. And to my amazement, they actually knew who I was. And that started off the role that I was to take. And I think of myself as the man in the middle. So, we, I, that's why I called this, this bit of the talk a man in the middle attack, because that's what it feels like. My role as a man in the middle then began to take shape, to help users to learn their software, to help them to understand developers' viewpoints and reasons for the way things were as they are, and to take any genuine concerns back to the developers, to help the developers by taking the strain and absorbing some of those frustrations, 
and when I have to go back with a genuine concern, to be able to discuss it dispassionately, to get a deeper understanding of what's happening and to pass that back to the users. That's a lot to take on in the first year there, but by 2008 it moved on again, Mechelen. When Danimo said, we need a moderator on a mailing list. And before I knew it, I was doing that job as well. I moderate three lists now. At the same academy, Danimo said, you know about tech base? And I said, yeah, yeah, I know. Writer said, we need user base. I've set it up and you're gonna do the work or some of it anyway. And that's how and when user base was born. I had used wikis before. I'd been heavily involved in the Mandrake Twiki that was long before it became Mandriva. And that was a purely user to user one. The devs didn't come anywhere near it. They left us alone. Later they had developed a new one. But originally it was users only. And I was surprised how many people did contribute. It was very different from what we're finding on ours. And we really need to find out why. Originally, when we set up user base, we were told that one of the purposes was to showcase our applications. And so we started off by producing a very thin catalog of them. Very thin, I mean, in terms of content. Just a, a brief feature list from which we hoped it would grow. But my ambition was to get those users in that had been good on the mandrake list, get the hints and tips in, so that the users were communicating with each other as well. And that hasn't gone as well as I'd hoped. Again, I want to know why, and I'm not having much success. If you know some of the reasons, come and talk to me. And then, of course, there was something that the Mandrake Twiki hadn't had, and that was languages. We had some translation on user base from the beginning, but it was not so easy to do, not so easy to handle, not so easy to control, not so easy to keep up to date. Consequently, you'll find some pages there that have half a page translated into French two years ago. And you know how valid that would be now. I'm not just saying French. It's an example because that's one I happened to land on by accident. So we needed a better way of dealing with that too. And while talking about this in a blog, it was accidentally almost read by Zpand from the <coughs> Wiki Translate, Translate Wiki extension. Works with Wikimedia, Media Wiki. And he came back to us and said, we could cooperate on this. And it's been great working with them. And as some of you will know, about a month ago, we finally got the, the base media wiki upgrade that we needed to be able to run that, that extension, and we've started using it. It took a long time, because the few system admins we had were too busy to learn media wiki to cope with all that. They couldn't take on more. We needed our own. And it wasn't until Ingo came up with the, the dedication to help us get there. But we've got it there. We've got translation in. You can now translate online, offline, use your favorite tools, post it back, over, uh, post it back onto the list, all without duplication of effort. But it needs manpower. So, what do I do? Well, I answer questions on mailing lists and on the forum, particularly in the office section. I keep the system as bleeding edge as I can bear, so that at least I know what questions are coming up. When I can't answer, I ask the developers directly. 
and I have to say, they're pretty good at getting back to me. When I get answers, I document them on user base. I've been part of the community working group for two years. That's not always comfortable. But as a group, we're proud to have helped, found a way to help developers. I'm proud to be part of the community. Thank you, Anne. Um, I'm next. And uh, some of you know me. I've been around in the community for uh, six, seven years. So uh, not as long as some people, but it's been a while. Uh, and mostly I do usability stuff. I'm also on the uh, KDE board. And so what I want to talk to you today is sort of this evolution of usability in KDE from before my time to where it is now. And it's definitely been an interesting journey. So in the beginning, just in the very, very, very beginning, Matthias Etrich had this great idea for an actual desktop environment, not just a windowing environment, that included functionality, configurability, to help empower users over their environment, not just give them technology, to have this technology work for them. This is KDE 1. It's pretty impressive for back in the day. It is very, very far away from where we've been now, and honestly, you know, it doesn't look that great. We've come a long way over the past 12, 13 years. And so uh, usability was not really something considered in the very beginning, but it was something that uh, showed up. So this is a screen or a picture from the first KDE developer community uh, conference. It's actually called Castle. This was before we started calling it Academy. And this event was important for two reasons. First, it was the first time that everyone, well, a lot of people from the KDE community got together to share their ideas. And having the community come together like this allowed people to get excited about the project, but also for them to work face to face and talk about new ideas and create a vision for the future of KDE. The second important part about this event was the introduction of this concept of usability to KDE. There were live demonstrations of usability, and then also Jan Ulig and Ellen Reitmeyer uh, from Relevantiv came and talked about usability. So this is whenever the concept of usability first started getting ingrained in KDE. However, this word usability <laughs> was actually a pretty bad word five or so years ago because people didn't really understand it. Uh, they thought it meant uh, something that's more towards marketing, doing whatever the user wants, uh, giving them as many preferences that, as they want, and not necessarily uh, help the developers maintain control over their own applications. And this is actually a misconception of what usability is. And honestly, I don't even like the word usability because it's misused even in industry and even in uh, my own area of research. Usability is a very small engineering term that means satisfaction, efficiency, and effectiveness. That's it. But when we think about usability, we think about the entire user experience. We think about design. We think about processes. We think about user <coughs> satisfaction. But there are a whole lo lot of other things that we want to consider with usability. And so lately, I've been trying to use the word user experience rather than usability because it is this more holistic approach to what it is that we're trying to do with KDE. We don't really care. Usability is just one part of it. But if you take, if, if you pay attention to usability too much or if you focus in on usability too much, you start to lose the bigger picture. We have business goals, we have user goals, we have technology goals. So usability, which sometimes focuses too much on the user, can't always help us meet those other goals. And so this is a picture from last year's desktop summit. And so when I talk about KDE, and uh, I tend to focus on three things. So KDE mostly is about the community. And so focusing on the user experience helps developers keep control of the technology while still you know, working with users and empowering users and providing users with great technology. But it's still very community oriented where usability tends to shift too much to the user. It's still focused on the technology though. 
it's not just about you know honing in on one single feature. It's not about dumbing down the interface. It's not about taking away features and functionality. It's about improving the technology as a whole, not just focusing in on one small piece of the technology. But of course it is about the users because we care about our users. Otherwise we would develop everything for ourselves. Also it gives us satisfaction to help empower people because that will make them more free to make choices and you know, Kitty will take over the world eventually. So people are important, whether people means me, whether people means us as the development community, or people means everyone, including the user community. So really, KDE is all about the experience. It's about the user experience. And that's how I'd like, to, like you to start thinking about this usability concept or thinking about good design as an experience rather than the engineering term usability. And that's it, over short. So my name is Camila. I'm from Brazil. So English is not my language. And <laughs> probably, maybe you won't understand everything I say. So please, if you don't understand after the talk, uh, ask me, do the questions. So uh, I would like to, in this year, I start to do uh, real something, uh, to do something for the KDE. KD. And uh, when I'm, uh, I'm, like I said, I'm from Brazil, and there I met some people who start to help me to uh, begin in this free software. I did some courses. In these courses, we began to go to some events about free software. But the teacher in Brazil don't use uh, plain so much about free software. Uh, they teach uh, you to use um, uh, Windows only. The students on use just know that. So when I met uh, some people from Brazil who is working for Kadi, uh, I start I start to to have uh, uh, the curiosity to know more something about that and help and do something to help the free software. So I start a, a user group and developer group in the Sofa Brazil. And we have been doing some talks and writing blogs. Um, and one of the members uh, is working Kade Rocks. Um, Wagner, he is in the uh, Google Summer of Code, uh, working Rocks. <coughs> in, the, uh, in the academy in Brazil, I start, uh, stood some QT and uh, start a Kade game. Uh, and now, we start a new group, Cadet Lovelace, with um, Amanda, Araceli, other girls from Brazil. And, and we have um, working. Uh, Amanda is, she's here. We are working, she's working in Cadet Promo uh, to, to, to get more people and speaking about Cadet for the people. And she organized uh, the free software forum of Minas Gerais. When we have Araceli too, she is working in translation, Cadet Promo, and she organized the uh, meeting and uh, in Brazil. So here we ha I have a cartoon that um, they made of us. And here are the girls. Uh, the first there is Amanda, me, 
Jordana, Tayane e Araceli. Um, and I think uh, that's it. Thanks. Okay, um, I'm Lydia and I'm going to talk about how I got from being a booth babe for KDE to herding cats. Um, a few years ago, I said, just in case, um, this window thing isn't actually that cool. Um, there has to be something better. And I um, started looking around and I found Ubuntu, which was a cool new thing at that time. And, and I tried it. And I was thinking, hmm, this is nice, but it's just not the right thing for me. And I was looking further around, and I found Kubuntu. And I was thinking, wow, this is cool. I can have um, Kate open a file on my server with Kioslave. And I can have um, conversation know about the emails of the people I'm chatting to um, by integrating into K address book. And all this stuff, it was really cool. It wasn't perfect, but pretty cool. And <coughs> then I started to get involved in doing stuff for Amarok, like writing small um, promo tags and so on. And a friend of mine who I'm studying with um, came to me and said, hey, um, there's Linux tag in a week or so. We need someone for the booth, and you're going to go with me. And I was like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> so I went there and went to the booth of Emerald. Um On the other side, there was the KDE booth with big names like Sebas and Danimo. And I was like, oh, God. <laughs> and I was staying in the booth, and visitors started coming in, and they were asking questions. And I had no clue. <laughs> and I was. Um, saying, uh, visitor came to me and was asking his question, and I said, "Sorry, I don't know." Ask Harold. <laughs> Next one came. Hmm. Sorry, I don't know. Please ask Swan. And this was going on for like 20 minutes or so, and I was like, "Okay, you actually know these answers because they're all asking the same thing." There were like 10 questions, and everyone was asking the same thing. Uh, okay, I can do that. So I was doing this pretty well for the rest of um, my first Linux talk, and I was hooked. This was easy enough, and um, I could help promote something I think is really cool. Um, and I got to know cool people. And so I was doing more promo stuff, um, specifically for Amaranth, but then also more for KDE, and I was attending events, again, playing Booth Babe. And this was all nice, and I liked it. But at some point, hmm, I'm actually more into the whole people side of KDE and not so much into promo. And so I started getting more into herding cats and um, helped. Um, build the, the Amarok community and make it better. <laughs> and what I was doing, that was saying like, oh, I'm, I'm doing pretty okay, but I'm actually not that awesome doing it. And someday they'll, they'll find out. And they actually didn't. <laughs> they, they made me their community manager. And I was saying like, hmm. They will find out one day. <laughs> and not too, too much later, um, Harold said, OK, I'm not I'm going to do releases for Amarok. You got to do it. And I was like, OK. <laughs> you think I can do that? Um, yes, you can do that. And so I started. And again, I was thinking, hmm, OK, I'm doing this pretty OK, but I'm actually not that awesome. And 
it's just okay. But, so, I was there, being a release manager and community manager for Amarok. Today, I know that I'm not the only one thinking, well, I'm not that awesome. There's actually lots of people out there. And this whole thing has a name. It's called imposter syndrome. And I bet there's some people in here, in this room, who have it as well. Um, not too much later then, I went to CBIT. And that was a rather devastating experience. Um, <coughs> I was standing at the booth and doing booth duty. Sven was standing next to me. We were, there were lots of people. And Sven standing next to me explaining some Amarok stuff to, to a visitor. <coughs> and there was really a crowd standing around him. And I was standing there on my own. Another visitor approached, clearly wanting to ask a question. And I approached him, asked, can I help you? Do, uh, do you have a question? Yes, yes, yes. Um, but I'm going to wait for him. I was like, whoa, <laughs> OK. Um, I'm the fucking release manager and community manager of this program. I can probably answer your question even better than him. But OK, wait for him. So this happened once. This happened twice. This happened a lot of times. And I was thinking like, OK, this is my last um, seabird. I'm, you're not going to see me again here. And actually, KDE is a pretty safe haven um, compared to um, non-community ones like uh, CBIT, for example. So, and today, after deciding not to go to CBIT again, um, I'm helping people do awesome, like um, managing GSOC and um, <coughs> uh, being part of the community working group. And what I want to take you you to take home is don't doubt yourself yet so much. You're doing great. So I uh, have the honor to close this thing before we uh, start move on to the questions. So uh, I'll try to not make it too long so we can uh, actually ask some uh, answer some questions afterwards. So I chose the title, The Trial and Error Approach, because when I was thinking about what would I want to contribute to this presentation, I thought, well, I could make a list of all the things I've done, and then I started thinking about it, and then I thought, man, nah, you know, it's kind of cool, but it's not that great. You know, it's just like Lydia said before, and then I started thinking through the <coughs> list, and I was like, you've got to be kidding me, come on. So, but still I, uh, I chose not to make this list because first of all, I think it's pointless. I don't want to bore anybody to death with that. Second, you can read up on that anywhere on the web. And um, I would much rather uh, address this kind of imposter syndrome that mostly or all of the women I have met and I have talked to really suffer from because they think like, yeah, I don't know that much actually, and uh, there's all those great guys out there, and they do this coding, and I just need some bug fixing on the side, you know. And um, we have a different approach. So a lot of men just go and say, "Of course I can do that," and uh, as soon as they turn around, they say, like, <coughs> "How am I going to find out?" So it's not uh, a woman thing; it's just a different approach. So um, just to put it in perspective, I'm rather old in this surrounding. <laughs> um, so my first um, uh, encounter with a computer was in 88 and it was um, text based so it didn't have windows and um, that wasn't actually a problem it turned out to be a problem when I went to university and everybody else had windows but me and I was like and at that time that was in 94 um, I had uh, a very boring boyfriend who was very much into Linux compiling and stuff. <laughs> so I had a lot of time for user groups and mailing lists. And um, I knew all the programs I needed for the, uh, well, shell, of course. And still, it's, I was told that, you know, that's not the real thing, you're just using it. And I was also told that um, since I had no programming skills, I would not be able to use Linux properly anyway. 
And then, you know, it's this women thing, they don't get it. So I'm not kidding you, I heard that from my boyfriend. And I dumped him <laughs> <laughs> at some point, which was probably a smart move, and uh, went to university to start something more appropriate, which was uh, at that time history, uh, oriental sciences, and French, which was not great either, but that's a different story. So to jump forward now, this is uh, 2008, I think. There I was standing uh, in front of a group of old men singing to a group of very old people and wondered if this is what my life is supposed to be. And I thought, no. <laughs> so I tried to experiment. And um, since I had this kind of computer thing going on all the time, and but of course I was just using it, right? So it was not great. But I felt like, you know, maybe you should give something back. Maybe you can write small blogs or something so that people would understand what it's all about. And uh, so I went to my first conference that was right around the corner in Krefeld, and I thought that was a cheap shot, so I could go and check out the people and if anything had changed since 94. I can assure you it was not much, <laughs> but I, uh, so I was greeted by, I, I arrived on a very early in the morning and uh, I was greeted by someone pointing a camera at me and saying, look, we have women. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah, well, great. And um, then I uh, walked around a bit and listened to some uh, presentations and I actually met Lydia. And I thought, huh, look, there's another one. And uh, we talked a bit, and um, I talked to Sebas at that time, and he said, yeah, you should start looking at the uh, promo list, maybe something will show up. Because I d really didn't have any point uh, where to start from. And I realized that those people were actually not that exclusive. And uh, so I thought, yeah, well, mailing lists, I know that concept, I can try. And uh, so it ended um, with me being the first time at a booth for KDE, because at that time I had um, a lot of spare time. My son was big enough and I could leave them at home for a while. So I went to Switzerland for the first open expo in that year, that was in March. I don't remember actually where that was. I couldn't find any photos, so anyway. And I did uh, the booth duty and had the exact same experience that uh, Lydia had for the beginning. I was like, well, you can click there <laughs> and maybe you find that somewhere in the preferences. But uh, you get more and more secure by doing this. And then, in 2008, I went to my first Linux talk. And that was the first time I actually um, organized quite a big thing, because Franz dropped out in the middle of it, because he had to do something, and he asked me if I could take over. So I was pretty busy, busy like a week, organizing hotel rooms, getting uh, the stuff up and running, and uh, organizing the merchandising, whatnot. Then I gave my first presentation. That was also in Switzerland in 2008. And trust me, I was dying on stage because I was thinking, I have no clue. You know, I'm talking about something I'm totally clueless about, um, which I made up with a nice slide so everybody could just watch the screen while I was stumbling around there. But uh, in the end, it turned out that people came to me and said, this was a very good presentation and we liked your style and we liked your, f your slides and it was a very interesting topic. It was actually K-Office too. And, uh, I'll leave it to that. So anyways, um, and I blogged about it and I got a nice uh, feedback from it and I thought like, yeah, well, maybe it wasn't that bad actually and I may actually even know more than other people. Go figure. Then I organized my first sprint and I went to a developer sprint. I mean, I can't write a single line of code. What am I supposed to do at a developer sprint? And uh, I was really, uh, when I sent my email to the EV board and saying, um, I would like to go, would you fund it? And uh, the, uh, the answer was, of course. What are you talking about? So I went to that sprint and uh, didn't feel that awkward, actually. So, yes. And then the next step is uh, the Camp KDE 2009. And there I didn't have a presentation, but I had a job. And uh, so in the meantime, I had started working for um, Nokia 
as the web community manager of Qt. And uh, I couldn't have done that if I hadn't built my self-confidence and the experience working with those people. And you know, I'm capable of translating developer speech to marketing or to marketeers, so they can make something out of it. And um, that wouldn't have been possible without all the support I got from other people, first of all, and uh, without the support that I, or the learning experience that I could try and fail and try something else and see where my actual strong points are and what I would like to do. And that I wanted to make a job out of, or a living out of what I love doing. And that was at that point definitely no longer singing in front of old men. So first presentation last year at Academy. That was my second Academy actually. So the first one was in Mechelen. And uh, again, when I uh, sent in my proposal for the presentation, I was sure it would be rejected because it was so fuzzy. You know, I had this kind of community talk and it was not, it's all those soft skills and it's a girl talk. So uh, I was very happy when it was accepted and I was very, very nervous on stage. Also, I tried to hide that on slides. <laughs> and just for the, the finalizing slide, this is how everything is relative. So suddenly I am standing in a group of people trying to fix their Wi-Fi because they couldn't log on. I mean, if I'm here, I usually say, can someone please set this up? I leave this to the experts. But you see there, um, the guy there, he was standing there totally like, what the heck is she doing? So it's uh, all about putting it into the right perspective and learning what you can do and what you can't and pushing the way that you can. And just to conclude, you can. Don't be afraid. Thank you very much, all of, uh, all of you. We would have time for one or two short questions. Yes, I am fast. Are there any questions? Yeah, excellent. excellent. <laughs> so there is one slide when you are singing, right? Could you sing for us? No? Okay, one question, one answer. <laughs> Another question? Then thank you very much. The next talk is beginning in a couple of minutes. Thank you.